this is fun because we're going to just talk about murder. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> the first dead body I remember seeing on TV. I used to wake up Saturday mornings early before everyone in the house, get my bowl of cereal to watch Kids Incorporated. But if I was up before Kids Incorporated started, they were playing jesus shows. There was one Jesus show. It was about some dude who got put up in front of a firing squad because he was a Christian. What? I know. So, is it a children's show or just a Christian no, show? No, it was an evangelical show, but it was <laughs> happened to be on right before Saturday morning cartoons started. Oh my God. Most times it didn't have any kind of violent stuff going on. So they had like a sad clown or they had a lady talking to her kids or whatever. But this was a guy going in front of a firing squad. And there was another guy there and he was like, just say you're, you don't believe in Jesus. And the guy was like, I can't do that. He gets shot by a firing squad. Wow. So much scarier than any of the horror stuff that we've seen. But I guess technically Jesus would have been the first murder victim I saw. It was just in catechism. Uh, wow. So a lot of Christians. Oh my God. Why do we watch shows about murders and murderers as entertainment? According to Dr. Scott Bond, who is a professor of criminology at Brew University, who also wrote a book called Why We Love Serial Killers, true crime triggers our basic emotion, which is fear. People watch a TV show or a film or listen to a podcast about these subjects and face their fears without actually experiencing the dangers of trauma directly. Women specifically are drawn to these stories. There are two big true crime podcasts. One is called Wine and Crime. The other one is called My Favorite Murder. Probably heard of both of those. Both of them draw huge audiences. Wine and Crime, all the way back in 2018, had about 500,000 monthly downloads. 85% of that audience was women. When my favorite murder went on a live tour, the women in the audience overwhelmingly outnumbered the men. In a study conducted by social psychologist Amanda Vickery, this is statistically women are more likely to be the victims of these violent crimes. So they are more fearful of being victims of violent crime. So they are interested in learning how to prevent it by understanding why a crime would be committed, learning about patterns and inner workings of a criminal mind. But also women gravitate towards stories of survival. I think it was like a Reddit thread. Someone was saying how they fall asleep listening to murder podcasts. I personally don't think I could do that. The other thing I thought was interesting was men tend to buy, read, and write reviews for books about war. Women do the same thing with true crime. It's controlled exposure. Oh, that is interesting. This is not a new thing. We as a society and a culture and just humans in general have been obsessed ever since people have been putting gallows in public squares back to the beginning of newspapers. These were the things that people were getting excited about and that they wanted to read about. I also uh, looked a little bit into it. I know that it's easy to blame COVID for a lot of things, but BC, it took a lot for me to watch true crime or I even was still having a hard time pulling the trigger on Mindhunter, even though I knew it was highly recommended. But during COVID, I could not get enough crime. Something just happened where it was like, I couldn't watch anything happy. I couldn't watch anything saccharine. I couldn't watch anything optimistic. It all had to be dark. And mm -hmm. that opened the lid on all of that. This article I saw, it's from The Ringer, and it says that during COVID, all of the top streaming series were murder documentaries. The shortest amount of time that one was in the top 10 was a week. So every time a new true crime documentary was being released, it would be the most popular thing. And that also the appetite for before right before covid may 2019 to april 20 was i guess normal so let's say true crime was the highest level of interest and then science was 72 percent and then historical documentaries was 60 percent and then social documentaries was 40 percent that like that true crime during covid more than doubled in, in 
like it as to what people were seeking online. As you would expect during COVID, all the categories went up some because more people were at home, more people were watching more hours of television. None of them went up more than 20 percent. The true crime more than doubled. I wonder if there's something to that about like the the everyday horrors that we were experiencing and the shortages and people were getting sick and people didn't have money because they were out of work. wonder if it was a desire to fall into another kind of trauma and grief about something that perhaps was solved and was it felt safe to watch something that wasn't our stories. Yeah, I definitely think it goes back to that feeling of having control. Like you just said, there's a particular way that it's going to end, but it's going to have an ending. Melissa, what show was too short? I would like to talk about the show Mindhunter. This was created by Joe Penhall and David Fincher. How surprising. It was on Netflix from 2017 to 2019, starring Holt McCallany, Jonathan Groff, and Anna Torv. It is a psychological crime thriller about the origins of criminal profiling, specifically serial killers. So David Fincher was at the helm for this. And if you're familiar with his stuff, this is very much in his wheelhouse. He directed Seven, Fight Club, Gone Girl, and Zodiac, among many others. Apparently, he was very hands-on and was not only a producer, but he directed many of the episodes and he was the de facto showrunner and oversaw the script writing as well as the overall production of the show. I am not drawn normally to these kinds of programs. I like thrillers. I like psychological dramas. I don't generally like to watch anything that's outright violent or scary. I just have a soft brain and I'm impressionable and I don't sleep well afterwards. All that said, I like the show and I think that it's an important story to tell. Mindhunter is based on a true crime book called Mindhunter Inside the FBI's Elite Serial Crime Unit. It was written by retired FBI agent John E. Douglas. The show borrows heavily from the book. And while the serial killers are modeled on actual real people, the FBI characters in Mindhunter, Agent Holden Ford and Bill Tench, are fictional. Something that's unsettling that I found in my research was that the prison scene dialogues were taken from real interviews with these convicted killers. So it's just very chilling. There are only any things to say, but <laughs> there are only two seasons of Mindhunter. Season one, it's set in the late 70s and early 80s and focuses on how this FBI behavioral science unit gets into the minds of these killers by talking to them and they start to study and track patterns. That was not previously done. That changed how these crimes were investigated going forward. Season two, agents Ford and Tench are investigating the Atlanta child murders that occurred between 1979 and 1981, which includes 29 cold case murders that they could never tie to the suspects. But as recently as 2019, some of those cases had been reopened and evidence would be retested using more modern DNA technology. Season one also brings in other infamous killers like David Berkowitz, also known as Son of Sam, and Charles Manson. And the casting for the show is so good. The actor that plays Edward Kemper, his name is Cameron Britton. I'm never going to be able to see him in anything else without thinking of him in this role. Very effective. Very fun. Yeah. Throughout season one and season two, there is a recurring character of a home security service person, and there are hints that he is possibly the notorious BTK killer of the mid-70s to early 90s. It seems pretty clear they were leading up to a season three that would be centered around his story, but they never got to do that. I would have liked to have seen how they were going to tackle that. There were apparently plans for a season three, but it was put on hold, put on indefinite hold so David Fincher could explore other projects. The actors were then released from their contracts in 2020. As recently as this February, David Fincher finally confirmed that Mindhunter was not coming back and the show was officially done. It's such a bummer. A good show. Great cast, creepy and interesting, the whole vibe of the show. Um, another one that you absolutely should not binge watch. They did a really good job of recreating those eras. I think there's a, a, a interesting shift now in um, like cinematography where when they shoot previous decades and eras, they the lighting is very different and it's very reminiscent of what you would remember as a kid from a Polaroid photo, like the certain 
way that they saturate things and film dark versus light. It's going to be something that it takes me a while to shake from my brain. You were the one who recommended this show to me, and I was surprised. I never like, you know, these detective procedurals where people are bantering over a dead body. Right. That's just cheap and gross. That plus this serial killer obsession we started to cross into. I thought, I'm not going to like this show. It was so different than anything I thought it was going to be. You can imagine it couldn't be in more capable hands than David Fincher. But even with that knowledge, it it was so well done. It was fascinating. Like you were saying, the forensic science coming along as much as it has since the 60s in conjunction with building a profile of the kind of people that do these kinds of crimes, seeing that boon because we have a way to contextualize it that we didn't have before. So I agree. I would have Love to see another couple of seasons of that and seeing how the unit comes together. It was nerdy in a way. (laughs) It's okay that it didn't go forever and ever, but I wish they just had one more season. One more season. They had more story there. It was so clear that they were leading up to something because they had, they were learning. As we were learning about what they were doing, you knew they were going to take that information that they had learned at that time that season one and two are based upon because they get a little better in season two and they were going to use that in season three to track this guy down. So I think that deserved a third season. I do want to say David Fincher is responsible for three of the worst nightmare images in my mind. (laughs) And two of them are from Zodiac. I didn't want to watch it all because it's set in the Bay Area. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though it was a long time ago, obviously, that was very scary when things are close to home. Go to those places getting creeped out just talking about it now. So, okay. So I'm going to move on. (laughs) (laughs) Death is part of life. It is represented on shows and sometimes they have to address it because somebody in the cast died. When Coach died on Cheers, all the adults were talking about it and they handled it well on the show. But what are some of the first first death that you remember being represented and did it affect you? That was actually the first one I had was Coach on Cheers. I remember not really understanding that he had died in real life. And then they, and it was between seasons And they talked about it when they came back. I learned later that he actually did die in real life and they wrote it in. But that's when they brought in uh, Woody Harrelson. And he, of course, became a big star. But that one was impacted me in in my understanding of how that all worked. I don't know how old I would have been, maybe nine or ten, maybe a little older. I'm not sure. I'd have to look up when that actually happened. And I had one that, that was not necessarily first, but it was really impactful, was when they killed off Mark Green on ER. Oh, yeah. It was like a like an extended episode. It was like an hour long or something. I remember it so well because they let him swear. There's a scene where he is like in a bed. He's in a lot of pain and he's trying to get out of bed and he falls on the floor and he yells out, shit. It just like rang in my head and I got goosebumps from it because I thought, oh, you don't get to do that on network television. I've never heard this before, ever. I was a teenager. But that one really stuck with me because it made me realize that when they're covering something really heavy like that, they change the rules sometimes. But like they, they let that moment happen because it felt real and human. That would still like think about it as jarring. The one that jumped to mind was when Mr. Hooper died on Sesame Street because they did take it as a teachable moment. And I remember my mom watching that episode with me. Most (laughs) days she would be doing whatever she was doing and I'd be watching Sesame Street. And that day she watched with me and feeling for however old I was and able to communicate those feelings, sad and moved by it and that everybody was showing their grief about it. I remember Maria and Louise sharing memories and talking to the Muppets to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. So I, that did actually, I think they did a, a good job with that. One that came up when I was looking at old shows that I used to watch was the dad on Give Me a Break because the actor who played the dad died during the production of the show. Now Carter was going to be their guardian. There was a real, it was very dramatic, especially for at that age, again, like maybe eight years old, not really understanding uh, all the stuff about found families and adoption and the court system and race and all that. And it was just like, what's going to happen now? Are we still going to be able to 
be a family and wow yeah I, that's a, a show that i remember watching but i don't remember so much about it i make me want to go back and, and watch some of the episodes most of the show was actually after he died mm. it makes me think of it is enough where they cast someone and then she like died when they were filming and then they had recasting oh my gosh yes that was uh john travolta's girlfriend diana highland she died very suddenly and then betty buckley norma desmond came in think the show you went too long another netflix show co-created and co-executive produced by greg berlanti and sarah gamble sarah gamble is the showrunner the first season actually aired on lifetime but then lifetime reneged on the season two renewal deal so then it was picked up by netflix this ran from 2018 it's actually ongoing they keep saying it's canceled or not canceled this is the last season just kidding. One more season. Just kidding. We're going to come back. And they just keep coming back. That's part of the problem. It stars Penn Badgley. He is the recurring lead character through all seasons. Elizabeth Lale, Toria Pedretti, Tati Gabrielle, and Charlotte Ritchie are the object of Joe's obsessions across season one through season four. It is a psychological thriller based on a book series by Carolyn Kepnes. Season one is based on the book You. Season two and three are based on the sequel called Hidden Bodies. Season four is completely not aligned with any of the, the books. Again, that's part of the problem. Season one is set in New York City, and we are introduced to Joe Goldberg, the protagonist and narrator, who is a seemingly harmless bookstore manager, but you soon realize he is an obsessive creep. He's not just the anti-hero, he is the bad guy. He's a sociopath and a stalker, and ultimately he's a serial killer. He's also a delusional romantic who has this very skewed sense of morality where he rationalizes his his horrible behavior in the name of finding true love. So in season one, he falls for a college student and when people around her start dropping like flies, she starts to dig around into his past, which of course is a total nightmare. And he ultimately kills her and covers it up. Season two is set in Los Angeles. Joe flees there to hide from his crimes under a new name and attempts to start a new life. But he almost immediately is back on his shit and he stalks and falls for a woman named Love Quinn, who is an aspiring chef from a wealthy, powerful family. Felt like Joe had met his foil in love. She is also a freaky weirdo with a dark past. He is able to share his secrets with her eventually. Instead of driving her away, it actually bonds them because, big twist, she has been stalking him and has horrible secrets too. Season two also gives you some backstory on Joe and why he might be the way he is. Of course, it's a childhood of violence and abuse. Season three is set in a fictional suburb outside of San Francisco called Madra Linda. I love this season so much. It was brilliant. Joe and Love are a perfect, awful match. They settle down in this make-believe Bay Area town that's super spot on with insufferable rich idiots. She starts a bakery and no one eats gluten, but they also do drugs and drink a lot. So Joe and Love have started a family and they both separately start to resent each other and these choices they've made together. Joe tries to keep his murder hobby on the down low but almost immediately he finds a new woman to obsess over, which is his neighbor. The body count on this season is crazy, and it's not just Joe who has blood on his hands. In fact, Joe and Love need each other's help cleaning up their messes. The season had you guessing right up to the final moments, and there's a totally diabolical ending, and I shouted, what?! at the TV. That, I think, is where the show should have ended. I felt like when we watched that, I thought that was the final season. I thought they weren't coming back. It's beautiful, it's poetic, funny, very darkly funny, but they came back. Season four is set in London and they released it in two parts. They released five episodes first in February of this year and in March they released the other five. And I just felt this season was completely unnecessary. It went astray. I think it's because there was no follow-up book to Hidden Bodies, which season two and three were based on. So the writers took things into their own hands outside the scope of the series. Things obviously fell apart spectacularly in California, so Joe flees this time for London. In this season, he's posing as a college professor. Again, he immediately like starts obsessing over someone and people all around this person start dying. There's like a whole episode, or a few of them actually, where it's like a murder mystery. Like They're in this big castle. And it, like, what are we watching? This doesn't make sense anymore. 
the way that the other seasons were. In season four, you never are quite sure if what you're seeing is happening or if it's in Joe's head. I think that the one good thing they did in season four was the writers finally address the mental health aspects of Joe's character, because obviously if you're going to behave this way, you have some problems. But they also made him get sloppy and make mistakes and choices he never would have in previous seasons. So it has been renewed for a fifth and final season, so they say. And it's supposed to take him back to New York, which is like the scene of so many crimes that people are aware of now. So I don't know how that's going to work. He's very public now about who he is and who he's connected with. So he's not going to be able to hide. I can't decide if I care. Do I want to watch this final season? I just don't have very high expectations. I think that season four kind of ruined it for me. But I would stop at three if you're going to watch it. Okay. I don't know if I will. I'm, I haven't yet. And I don't know. I don't know. Victoria Pedretti, who we watched in Haunting of Hill House. Mm-hmm. She's so great in this. And I think you'd like her character. Okay. All right. I might still. Much more of a character for her to chew on to than in Haunting of Hill House, where she's a broken, sad person. This is a fairly new category for me, too. Sure. I, I have, like, I was a bit chilling. I really like the deuce, the rubber durst. Mm-hmm. durst. That may have been my very first step into that sort of genre. I think that I tend to lean towards things that have been solved. It's very old men who are sitting in prison now. They're not going to commit the crime again. I, I feel a little more comfort knowing that I'm not watching something in real time. Those are too scary. I liked that one a lot because I just thought that the way that they that story unfolded was creepy and effective. I thought the Alec Murdoch one was pretty good. I like that. I have listened to some good podcasts that I've enjoyed. Sure. That were... Yeah, yeah. I definitely think podcasts are the domain of, I'm trying to think, I consumed so many during COVID. There was one I watched recently. It was another British one. It was called Little Boy Blue. And it was based on a true story about a young kid outside of London. He was walking home from a soccer game and he got shot. What I liked about it was they centered the family. They just did a very good job. That's what we connect with is the human experience that people are going through. So whether it is you find out the horrible abusive background that led this person to these horrible choices or mental illness or or the the grieving family, that's the stuff that makes the, the story compelling. Just the loss, the grief what people are going through and if it's done in a way that that doesn't feel like they're being taken advantage of too that that changes how you view the story one that was hard to watch is that it's about the girls that go to the catholic school do you remember that oh, one was that, that called keep the keep, keepers something keepers that was Secret rough. Keepers. i apologize that this is turning into a british crime episode i very rarely see a stinker when i'm watching british <laughs> series anyway i passed by this one called the barking murders many times Not because it's something I wasn't interested in, but because Stephen Merchant was playing the murderer. And I thought there's no effing way that I can watch this and Stephen Merchant is going to be the the killer. There's no, I'll tell you what, he was fucking scary. It was frightening how good he was in that role. They don't know how many men he killed, but he would hook up with men on an end and then roofie them. Some of them probably lived. They went home the next day and they hooked up with this guy and he was weird, but several of them died because he didn't know what kind of dose he was giving them or that was part of his kink. Like he gave them too much. Oh God. And one of the weird little asides about that story is that he started to leave the body of the person in this cemetery near his house. And this poor woman was walking her dog one day and the dog found the deceased person. And the woman was probably thinking, that's never going to, that's a once in a lifetime thing. It's going to be fine to walk through this churchyard again. I do it every day. Found the second body. Oh, no. I guess that she never went back to that churchyard again. Oh, my God. Every time you'd be with your dog, you'd just be like, yes. Absolutely none of those cases ever talks about people. Going to therapy and getting the help they might need to deal with, you know, where they're at now. And that's, how could you not need therapy? (laughs) 
The one that I chose for Just Right, and it's not perfect, but in terms of just telling a symmetrical story, was The Fall, which you will not be surprised, is another British show created by Alan Cubitt and starring Gillian Anderson and Jamie Dornan before he became Mr. Gray. Producers, Gillian Anderson. Alan Cubitt, Patrick Irwin, Justin Thompson Glover, and Stephen Wright. It was produced for Fables Limited, Artist Studio, BBC, Northern Ireland, and RTE. I watched it on PBS, but you can find it on, I believe, Netflix now, and it's on PBS, and it's on BritBox or Acorn, one of those. It had three seasons, only 17 episodes. It first broadcast in 2013, and concluded on 2016 on BBC. Detective Gibson, she is brought in because there's no progress being made on these murder investigations. In the local precinct, they present the fact that she's there to oversee their investigation. The other thing that's interesting is at the same time as you're seeing the detective's point of view, you're also seeing Jamie Dornan, the serial killer's point of view. Paul Spector, and he's a husband and father, which makes it even squickier. He is very prolific. Again, that interplay, like I was talking about with Happy Valley last time, they know that they're stalking each other and it's just going to be a matter of time before they have their confrontation. Also, the Paul Spector character, the serial killer, is egotistical and thinks he's too clever for particularly any female detective. That also plays into it. He's He gets a kick out of, you know, manipulating vulnerable people and he's really fucked up. There's a lot of fucked up in this and not just the murders, but just his daily behaviors. Series two ends with they're closing in on him. She's got what she needs. They're going to go get him. And there is a crash and a shootout. You don't know going into season three who's alive and who's dead and if anybody's going to face the consequences for these murders. In series three, Vector becomes a Charles Manson kind of figure because he's attractive and charismatic. He's got these groupies under his sway. And so then Gibson is at risk because of that. Also, she's very disgusted by the level of his crimes. So she is determined to see him behind bars, but they don't have a... a solid like a open and shut case just yet so she's still working on it something shockingly violent that you don't normally see in these types of series does happen i don't want to spoil it but what happens at the end of season three is something that divided the fan base because Let's just say he escapes justice, but it is a conclusion and it's very sad not knowing the scope of the crimes. There are probably dozens of murders out there that will never be solved. People felt there should have been maybe a door left open to revisit these cases and these characters. That's not likely to happen. They had a resolution that was not the one I would have picked, but it. But I understand that it, you don't always get the bad guy. So I think that makes it more interesting sometimes when that's the choice. So I'm okay with that. I think that for the cat and mouse part and for the level of just fucking psychoness that <laughs> he brings to this character, it's uh, worthwhile watch again it's only 17 episodes over three seasons i don't remember ever hearing about this one even from you cheryl and maya watched and then recommended to us it's been a while maybe it's just me but i do remember at the time thinking i've not seen anything quite this graphic in a fictional show <laughs> it was disturbing possible that there are other shows that i missed that were on the same level but i don't think so because it's gotten so much attention in crime drama circles uh, it has a beginning middle and an end it tells a complete story a disturbing story with interesting 
characters who are a little bit different than what you've seen before. Jillian mm-hmm. Anders, as she should, won a bunch of awards for it too. I never appreciated her back in the day. I never watched X Files. I, I I missed a lot of the, the film she was in. So while this was ten years old or so, that's still new to me. I'm gonna put this one on my list. I I just think she's great. Definitely when they start to go into the crime scene, just close your eyes. Just do one of these. But <laughs> other than that, it's one of my favorite things that she's in. Oh, I will say, if you decide to go back and watch You, it is very violently graphic. It's a different kind of a show. It is still, it's like there's a narrator. There's a, there's very dark humor behind it. It's the whole time the narrator is the serial killer. He is telling you and justifying his, his actions. So it detaches you from the gore, but it definitely has some fucked up bloody moments. So if you're sensitive to that, yeah. maybe that is not a good one. Okay. I think I've become less sensitive to it just through exposure. I still get a shock by it because for so long they would maybe show a person's arm or yeah. they wouldn't show the full on to movie yesterday and the, this guy got shot in the head and they showed his brains and okay they showed it the first time but then they show the wife having flashbacks when they showed it every time I'm like come on man i think that the show that crossed the not cross the line, but it pushed me over out of my comfort zone with that stuff and then changed how I saw everything afterwards was Breaking Bad episode with the bathtub. Yeah, and yeah. I think that once I saw that, it's not that it didn't affect me the same way or that it didn't affect me at all. It just changed how I looked at it on TV. <laughs> I was looking for commentary or research about true crime. One of the things that came up was people believing now, because we have said so much exposure to true crime, that our judgment is better than it actually is. Our brains, our little computers that solve problems all day long, those problems were, where am I going to get my neck bigs from the trees? Where am I going to hide from that woolly mammoth? Where am I going to... And then as those problems started to be resolved, our minds puzzle over things, whether it's anxiety or judging people or being comment warriors. This started to happen when DNA started to be introduced into the criminal justice system, but also true crime and justice programming that people were much less likely to think somebody was guilty if there wasn't DNA evidence. And why isn't there DNA evidence? Basically, this idea of we're all experts now at solving crimes because we've watched so much crime. That's not true. First time I heard that only 50% of murders get solved. A, because people go missing, but also B, because there is that burden of proof. We need, the, you need more than just a feeling to say people committed a crime and to arrest them and charge them and all of those things. We're afraid of not knowing the answer. I think too, we kept seeing it in movies and TV where the cops would bungle stuff. It was a small town really just fucking up the crime scene, walking through through there. We know that from the John Benet Ramsey case. Like every there's so many of those that we watch. So I think it does give people that idea. And also when we've seen it happen where like serial, that podcast brought back to light a a case and people were retried because of not just that they'd found possible new evidence and things that they should maybe consider, but that it was now in the public eye in a way that was people were focusing on it. So they had to come out and do something about it. Documentaries about victims of crime, just as many harrowing documentaries about victims of shoddy police work. So I'm it not, was, don't want to discount the work that people are doing to say it's not always mal- malicious, but people's lives are ruined. A murderer. That was, that's yeah. a very good, that, that was a devastating one. Yeah. I think that we see that over and we're like, why can't they do a better job? Why did they screw that up? Like wh- we just were watching the, the Alec uh, Murdoch one. Oh um, God. All like, they just, so much of that. It wasn't people like being incompetent. It was people who were bought and paid for by that family that were in law enforcement that were making choices because they knew it would affect them directly. So they were covering things up. So you see that over and over again. You're like, this is why we think we can solve these because the people who are in charge aren't doing their jobs. There was a good documentary on HBO called Burden of Proof. It was, I think it was on this year. It was 
a brother funds, self-funds a documentary and hires a journalist to help him figure out what happened to his sister who went missing when they were, when she was a teenager, because he believed that his parents were involved. And it's heartbreaking because I'm just going to spoil it for you. It's clear they are not involved, but because of not sloppy, but also not diligent mm -hmm. investigation, all of it is lost now because it was years ago. And the idea that it might ever get solved is probably a very rem remote possibility. He kept going back to his mom and being so mean to her. And as the viewer, I'm like, she might be involved. She might not be. I, I have no idea. But then by the end, it's clear that she wasn't involved. And they had this rift of 20 years based on an inkling. Yeah. Um, Really more about grief than the yeah. actual at that point because yeah. it's people just struggling to figure out what to do with what they've the trauma they've been through. I was thinking of one that was very good. I watched when it early on when it came out. It's when they see us, which is about the Central Park Five. That was so yeah. heartbreaking and well done. I didn't know that story until talk I about watched fucking. That. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, do it. Go for it. Talk about fucking idiots who think that Ugh. they know more than they know because why? For no reason. Just because he's a racist. Just the because reason. he's racist. That's yeah. The whole reason. Yeah. A fucking asshole. About a dozen downtown businesses were boarded up Wednesday and glass littered sidewalks following two nights of protests over the police shooting of an unarmed black man. Surf's up, three to six foot, southwest swell. 38 deaths are being blamed on this record heat wave and it's expected to continue for at least another three days. Mid positive views on the sector from Wall Street, but blue chips fell victim to a set off after a two session rally that propelled the Dow Industrials through the 10,000 level. So the show that I would rewrite, yes, another British crime where <laughs> called Unforgotten, created by Chris Lang and starring Nicola Walker, who is one of my favorites, Sanjeev Bashkar, Peter Egan, uh, Lewis Reeves, Pippa Nixon, Carolina Maine. I don't know what this is called because it's not an anthology, but it's also not a procedural. So we have the core detectives and their work dynamics and their sometimes their home lives and what's going on with them but then the season each season is its own case and it takes the mm -hmm. whole season so we've seen a lot of those i don't know if there's an official term for that but that's what this is nicola walker plays dci cassie stewart sanjeev bashkar plays Sun di sunny khan and they are homicide detectives who specialize in cold cases. Usually the season will start with some worker in a construction yard, some gardener in a public garden, somebody in a field uncovering human remains. And they're called in because the crime is a certain number of years old or older than that. And the series has a different cast each time of between five and eight potential suspects who are involved in the deceased person's life, who were with them around the time of their death, and who then Sonny and Cassie have to eliminate as suspects one by one. There's the classic misdirection and it's never the first person they talk to until it is and all, or is it more than one person or how would all these people know each other? Have they talked to each other since then? All that stuff. So it's, it's building their history, building the case, fig figuring out who the victim was, what their life was like. The grounding of it is this relationship between Sonny and Cassie. The actor who plays Sonny is a comedian. So he brings this comedic deadpanness to the role that he and Nicola Walker play with that, even though it's very serious subject matter and it's very heavy. They have a lovely dynamic. It's not one I've often seen because 
It's not that they're romantically in love with each other, but they love each other. It's also not that they have that partnery banter that usually you see two detectives have, but it's a deep love and affection and respect for each other. Then you get a little bit into their home lives and their backstories and things like that. Not a ton, but enough to get a good flavor of what's going on. What happens, spoilers ahead, is in season four, uh, uh, Nicola Walker decided to leave. So they end up killing her off. That's okay. That's a choice. Again, there are only a, a certain number of things that you can do. For season five, they bring in another actor to take her job. Sinead Keenan, who I have seen in other things, very compelling, and I'd watch her in a lot of stuff. But because of the specialness of the relationship between Sonny and Cassie, but I think it worked in the same way. And it's a real gamble when you do that. It's difficult. My rewrite would not be that complicated, but I think because of the relationship between Sonny and Cassie, to just partner him up with a new partner right off the bat was jarring. There were a couple of ways you could handle it. Sonny, he says in season five, they've offered me the boss job several times and I've turned it down. Basically, I can't fill Cassie's role. And what I would have liked to seen is them coming to Sonny a few times and saying, are you ready to take this role and him working on the new case while also working on processing this loss, bonding more with the rest of the team that also is feeling this loss. And then maybe towards the end of season five, either Sonny deciding that he will take the boss's position, he'll take Cassie's old job and promote one of the young upstart who he's been working with. Or if they still wanted to bring in the other actor to have it be something like they meet on a crime scene and they start talking with each other and either she knew Cassie or they have something in common and they start working together casually and then find out that she's open to a transfer. Because the way they started season five was there's this friction. Sonny's still upset and distressed. The new boss is doing things all wrong and she's having her own shit at home. And you don't really care because she is the interloper. I think not only would it have helped the audience to accept whoever that new person was going to be, but it also then helped the audience process through all of that with Sonny while he is working on this new case and figuring out what now. That's, I think, what I would have done. I might go back and try again to start watching again. They did, towards the end of season five, start to resolve some of that interpersonal stuff. But I think to honor that relationship and also make it a more of a meaningful transition and they just jump straight into, I know that's what happens. You lose a partner, you get a new one, but I think it would have helped to smooth that transition over. So I know you're talking about like when they, when a role is recast, when the show is still ongoing, that really gets tricky and strange sometimes because you grow attached to those characters and those relationships and it changes the show. So Maureen, what is your recommendation for a current show that you're watching? Okay, this is a few months ago now, but because we're doing the murdertainment episode, I decided to go back to Under the Banner of Heaven. Dustin Lance Black adapted John Krakauer's 2003 nonfiction book, Under the Banner of Heaven, for FX and Hulu. As we have mentioned before, Hulu doesn't do release all in one day. They Mm -hmm. will weekly release so i think they started with maybe two or three episodes and then the rest of them were episode to episode starring andrew garfield sam worthington daisy edgar jones wyatt russell rory culkin produced by jason bateman jillian oh, really Bateman. Mm-hmm. Huh. bateman has a thing for crime he's yeah he's the role of these kind of things actually dustin lance black brian grazer ron howard that was produced for hungry jackal productions aggregate films imagine television and fx you can watch the whole series on hulu right now though 
I strongly suggest taking break between each episode, oh, yeah. not a bingeable yeah. series. So the book gives the background of the Mormon church and how polygamists sect begin started to break away from the Mormon church and how there became this proliferation of little enclaves out west and then focused on the true crime of a murder of a young woman named Brenda Lafferty and her baby at the hands of her brothers in law who were part of a fringe Mormon cult. It was very tricky, I believe, having read the book, transferring this onto the screen, making it from the point of view of the detective and who is himself a practicing Mormon who is investigating this crime. But it was well done, very emotional, got many points across that I think were essential. And the one debate that we're having about true crime is about how we regard and depict the victims. And are they being honored? Are they being viewed as just a plot point? Or are we getting a picture of the whole person? And I feel like Daisy Edgar Jones, she did such a wonderful job with bringing this character to life, and this person to life, and giving her energy and an optimism and a kindness and a real three-dimensional look at the person. Dustin Lance Black did a good job of showing her as anchored in a loving family and that she had hopes and dreams and how she ended up in this marriage and in this family. So what I want to say about that is it's really well done. I think it honors the victims. But for me, the context that was removed was that the book was inspired by 9-11. What John Krakauer said was basically, we don't need to look elsewhere to find this kind of religious fucknuttery. We have it right here at home. And we have since we started. Wow, I didn't realize that that's interesting. The reason that's important is that another offshoot of the true crime fascination has been the cult fascination and documentaries and podcasts and high profile cases in the news about people belonging to cults and straighting cults and getting rich from cults. And again, us thinking that we're smarter than we actually are. How could any educated person be sucked into X, Y, or Z? If you've got a brain, your brain can be programmed. This polygamous brain began with Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. It didn't come from nowhere. Also, any religion or any belief system, any dogma, is a cult and has the capacity to turn into a powder keg. It was inevitable that this was going to happen. At the same time, we like to believe that as a human race, we are more sophisticated than the last generation or the generation before. We ain't. Nope. Yeah. So that's my recommendation and my rant. <laughs> It was a very, whew, that was a, that's a hard show to watch, but it was very well done. I had to do it in bite-sized pieces. I think there were at least two of the episodes where I stopped where I was and I was like, I need to walk away for five minutes. It's just so dark, especially when they start, when they show you that families, like how extreme their beliefs became and how controlling they were over the women and the children. It's just really upsetting, but it was a very well told story. Yeah, yeah. I, de I definitely think Andrew Garfield did a beautiful job playing with the fears about his own faith while yeah. and I thought that was a good. And that's why Dustin Lance Black was the ideal person to write it, because he was raised Mormon. What about you? What's your recommendation? A show I liked that I watched recently that I highly recommend is called Three Pines. And it premiered in December of last year on Amazon Prime. It's based on the Chief Inspector Gamache book series by Louise Penny. It stars Alfred Molina, Rasif Sutherland, Ella Maya Tailfeathers. Tantu Cardinal and Claire Coulter. It is a limited series procedural mystery. And I will say it didn't get picked up. It wouldn't be a limited series had it been picked up for a second season. But there are four separate crimes that they cover in the series. 
but they each span two episodes where the mystery is set up in part one and then they solve it in part two. One thing that I wanted to say that I liked was it was not a show where it was like they come in and they solve the crime in a week. It's clear that seasons pass. They come for the second half and it's snowing where before it was the spring. So it's They did a good job of making it feel realistic in that way. There's a common thread as all of these um, crimes are set in the same small rural Canadian village and it's the same team of investigators. But there's also a greater connective tissue throughout the series. There is an ongoing unsolved missing persons case of a young Indigenous woman where the family struggles to get authorities to give it the same kind of attention as other similar cases in the area. There's also a horrible history of a former residential school, which you later find links many of the people still living in the village. And deeply sad at times. These are obviously stories that don't get told as often as they should. Uh, social commentary throughout the show is thoughtful, but it never feels exploitative because it also deals with the grief of these victims and the families and there is hope and resilience as well so i feel like that was important that they don't make it just a crime show it's not just about murder and violence it shows families being loving and supportive of each other the performances are compelling Alfred Molina is very calm and measured, and he sees things that no one else can, which is what makes him very good at his job. Ella Maya Tailfeathers plays another detective who kind of becomes Inspector Gamache's protege, and she has to grapple with her role as a cop when she's so aware of how law enforcement has failed these Indigenous families. And this was, again, it was not renewed for a second season. In fact, season one ends on a cliffhanger, which made me gasp out loud. I guess I'm going to have to read the books or figure out which book where, you know, that cliffhanger happens so that I can figure out where it goes from there. I was disappointed. I thought that they could, there's clearly a lot of mystery and terrible history in that small town. I think there would have been a lot more stories they could have talked about because I definitely would have tuned in for that. I just thought it was a thoughtful show and I don't normally go towards the procedurals like that. But just like right from the first episode, I felt drawn to it. Noir cut almost, I'm going to get some haters here, almost if Twin Peaks would have been better. (laughs) Everybody's a little bit odd and it had that weird darkness to it too, but just much better storytelling. I feel about Twin Peaks, so. I didn't finish it, to be honest. I did like it. I liked the ambiance, and I liked him, and I liked the characters. Like you said, I liked, I think I stayed for two crimes. That's something I haven't seen in a detective in that way before. He had a humility, and he had optimism, I guess is the word. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting character. Yeah, I think he was complicated, and he also had like a, a respect and like he understood the gravity of what he was doing and it wasn't just like oh it's another dead body it's another case yeah he agreed well he was respectful of the families and what they're going through and yeah it was nice to see a character that was multifaceted and not just like a snarly bad mood cop Melissa, we are not seeking advertisers because we talk about television all the time. And no Patreon. No Patreon for us. But we would like to encourage people, if they enjoy the show, to kick some dollars to the charity that we profile. So what is your charity this week? Since we were talking about such a heavy subject, I wanted to keep it in the same vein. The charity that I have to focus on today is called endthebacklog.org, and it is about ending the rape kit backlog. Federal government spent over $1.3 billion to clear rape kit backlogs since 2011, but as of last year, there are 25,000 untested rape kits that are sitting in law enforcement agencies and crime labs across the country. And the backlog is an organization that they have six different pillars of how they're how they function they help provide financial assistance to go through the inventory, to test the backlog kits, to test new kits, implement tracking, provide victims' rights information. They work to fund reform through government. One of the reasons why this is so backed up is that these kits are collected and booked into evidence, but often DNA is not requested when these things go to trial. These kits are sent to crime labs for testing, but they just languish. These are small departments that don't have funding. They don't have enough people on hand. This is the backlog. And the backlog.org is a way to support this effort to end these rape kits stacking up. I had read that they had introduced a 
legislation about clearing the backlog, but I didn't think about the fact that there would be groups funding that session. Yeah, I, they're trying to change public policy. I had a list and they were showing the state where they provided funding and we're working towards clearing the backlog and the states and you could see where there was no change where there was no nothing shifted sometimes where it even got worse but then there were states where you could see clear and direct impact of the funds that they were receiving oh wow because of the, the fact that there's advocacy and money behind this certainly helps with that effort so i just i didn't know about it either until i did a little digging and i feel like it's a worthy organization to support if that is something that you feel compelled to find we hope you enjoyed the episode Share your endings with us at RecConnection.com or on Instagram at RecConnection.